Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm not Mitzi. I know you're used to Mitzi. I'm her cousin. You're going to have to deal with it. Um, and I didn't bake any cookies, which is entirely my fault, so I'm sorry about that. I know. I know. Quiet in the back. I'll have you ejected. Um, Anyway, so thank you very much for coming. Uh, I'm personally very excited about this as an archaeologist. Um, it's so exciting to hear from other archaeologists about other things. Um, so Dave's going to speak to us about the Timna Valley, but I mean really the sensational um, title of this really should be, Are These King Solomon's Mines? So um, that's fantastic. I just wanted to also say that uh, next week our program is a revisiting of Notre Dame Cathedral. Um, I'll be making that presentation next week. Um, we'll talk about what's up with the building right now. Um, so yeah, so just no spoilers. It's it's still a ruin. Um, so, <laughs> but but anyway, uh, so so that's what we're doing next week. But this week, I am very very pleased to have our own local Alan Quartermain, Dave Stephan, become talk to us about King Solomon's Mines. Everybody, welcome. Dave. Thank you very much for being here. Um, this was a, a great, great trip for me, and um, just something that uh, I highly recommend for anybody to do, even if you do it, do it for just a, a short, short time. Um, my sister is here in the back, and she reminded me to tell everybody how I learned about this dig, and um, every year the uh, Biblical Archaeology Review puts out a list of digs in the Holy Land. And this is a really great magazine. It's probably, even though it's a popular journal, it's probably the most scholarly of the popular journals. Um, so I definitely definitely recommend it. Um, it's got a lot of uh, kind of the, the current interpretations, uh, a lot of the, um, the ongoing projects, lots of descriptions of the ongoing projects. And what was really interesting is a lot of the people that I've been reading their articles in this, I got to meet on this dig. So that's how I discovered it. Um, being a historian and not not you know being familiar with archaeology, but not terribly familiar with a lot of the methodology and everything of it, I thought that this was going to be a great trip to go on. And uh, Timna, being in the middle of the Arab Desert, gets extremely hot in the summertime. So. I would say 90% of the digs in Israel are done in the summertime, but most of those are in the Judean highlands, they're on the Mediterranean coast where it doesn't get deathly hot, and a lot of their, uh, their labor force is college kids that are able to do it for credit, able to do it over summer break. So for me, this worked out really well, um, you know, being involved in, in forestry and uh, a lot of summertime type of, of, of labors, uh, this being in February, worked out really well for me to, to go on this. And uh, it was just as the pandem pandemic was starting, so it was February of 2020, and um, so it, it worked out well. I was a little nervous about getting back. It's like, what am I going to do if I'm stuck in Israel for who knows how long? The, the, the almonds were blossoming, the pomegranates were coming off. Like, well, I can, I can harvest, I can harvest farm, farm crops for a living. So uh, I, I needed to consider that. So um, that was kind of fun. So. Uh, first of all, the, the question is, were these King Solomon's mines? And um, Tony referenced uh, Quartermain and the, the novel, uh, which came out in the eight, Kidder's novel, I think it was, uh, came out in the 18, late 1800s. And um, there's actually no mention of King Solomon's mines in the Bible. But it begs the question, he was able to, to build a fabulous temple, create an amazing capital city, you know, where did his wealth come from? And uh, there was a transition really from uh, the, the Israelites being very much a, a pastoralist and nomadic people to suddenly being a very much urban trading people and pretty much being in the middle, the middle of everything during the King Solomon's reign especially. So uh, that, that really is where that, that question comes from, uh, where these King Solomon's minds, we know that he had, had great wealth. Um, in the, in the book, uh, there's you know, egg-sized diamonds and things like that that were fabulous treasures, but the practical treasure in those days was copper, it was bronze, it was things that you could make tools, weapons out of, and that you could trade. You could trade these materials in, in raw form and ingots. Um, also, uh, something that they had uh, even earlier than that was something called prills, which were just like little BBs of copper, which were uh, a trade item. So you could 
refine it to the point that it's these little little BBs and you could trade them and then people could make whatever they, they needed out of it or combine it with, with tin, um, combine it with other things to make brass or, or bronze or other useful items. <coughs> so the geographic context, so we're talking about the uh, Arava Valley, so the Arava Valley is uh, an extension of the rift, the Palestinian rift, which the Jordan River flows down from Galilee to the Dead Sea, the Dead Sea being the, the lowest place on Earth, so 1,300 feet below sea level. The Arava is the continuation of that valley as it, as it tips upward, it's, it's tipping up, but it's going south, and it's going south to the little point of the Gulf of Aqaba, which is one of the two points that comes off the top of the, the Red Sea. So the, uh, the geological, the geographic context, that's, that's really what it is. The geological context, uh, to the east you have the, the Mo Moabite Mountains, which are actually in Jordan. And they're, I don't think you can quite see them in this picture, but um, they're uh, just an immense wall of mountains. And then just slightly over and to the, the northeast of that is the city of Petra. And you'll see a lot of the, the area, especially on the west side, is that same kind of red sandstone that we see in Petra. And um, something that was fairly easily, easily worked. Um, in this case, it wasn't worked for making buildings, but it was worked for mines. And the, the telltale kind of pale blue markings in that sandstone was the copper that they were looking for. So the context, um, this area was also what we know from the Bible as the wilderness, so the biblical wilderness, where the Israelites during the Exodus wandered for 40 years, and um, it is the area that is just adjacent to the Sinai Peninsula. Um, we know that there had been Egyptian mining going on in this area, as well as the Kenites and the Midianites uh, and their kingdoms. And then the kingdom that we're really, really concerned about, and they're really a mysterious people, are the Edomites. And the Edomites, because they were a, um, just a nomadic culture, we don't, we don't have a lot of material remains of them. We don't have a lot of writing. We have basically nil as far as those, those remains, uh, as far as telling what their culture was. But um, then beyond that, the Nabataeans, I mentioned Petra. So the Nabataeans were a... Uh, very powerful uh, desert trading society, and they, they were able to, to build Petra uh, after the time of Christ, and they also, being, being in an area where they could trade with Africa, Asia, Arabia, they were in a really good spot, and we see, um, you know, the, the complexity of their buildings, their, their architectural art was just unsurpassed, as well as their ability to harness the water uh, that fell on those rocks, and they had amazing aqueduct systems, some of which are still working today, you know, 1,700 years later, uh, are still still working and del delivering water. So the Nabataeans, you know, another, another kind of mysterious uh, race that we don't hear about too much. Um, the Romans, of course, were in the area, um, and then the very last period was the, the Muslims, so the Muslims coming in after about 700 A.D. So archaeological projects in the area of Timnath, the, it was early, early, early on recognized as a copper smelting area by the Welshman uh, John Petherick in 1861. Um, Alois Musel was a, a Czech explorer that came through in about 1902. But these guys, they had such a huge area to, to study, they did a very kind of cursory survey of the area. They said, okay, we see this, we see this, um, but you know, we've got hundreds of more square miles that we'd like to do survey on. So the, um, the first huge, you know, really in-depth um, expedition was done by a, name, name, a guy named Nelson Gluck in 1935. He was uh, an American rabbi. Um, he was actually the, the, the rabbi that gave the benediction at JFK's inauguration. Uh, he was a historian. He was an academic archaeologist. Um, his real strength was pottery. So in, in the field of pottery identification, he was pretty much second to none. He was just the, the foremost in the field uh, of identifying pottery in, in the entire you know, Middle Eastern area. Um, and in fact, he was the one that discovered and identified the Nab Nabataean civilization of Petra. So that, he already had, had that to his name. 
when he started to survey the area around Timna. Um, he wrote a really interesting book called Rivers in the Desert, and that was a really, really touched on a lot of the, the, the tribes and the um, Edomites and the Kenites and some of those, those tribes that we don't really hear that much about in mainstream um, archaeological uh, you know, scholarship, but, but were definitely very, very important. And he was the one that you know, initially popularized the idea of these being uh, Solomon's mines. So the next, next uh, kind of major player in the Timna archaeology story was Benno Rothenberg. Um, Rothenberg, he was just a really, really amazing guy. Uh, this, is, this is his book, which is entitled, Were These King Solomon's Mines? Um, he was born in 1914 in, in Germany. Um, his parents had the, the presence of mind to move the entire family uh, to Israel, uh, to Palestine, it, it was at the time in 1933, just as things were getting very bad for the, for the Jews. So he was able to uh, just pretty much spend his whole life. He, he, he died in 2013, so he died 98 years old. And, um, but just a, a, a very, very interesting guy. Um, he actually started out as a photographer, but he was also a poet, and he was actually um, the Nelson Gluck's uh, photographer. That's how he started out fo photographing all of the things on Gluck's uh, expeditions. And so he started to learn all these things that he was taking pictures of, and so Gluck made him uh, an expedition supervisor and then also the, the field administrator. And I think if, if you want to talk about an un unsung hero of archaeological digs, the, the administrator is it, because they have got all of these logistics, who's, you know, got to make sure that the, the archaeologists get their coffee, that's oh. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, make sure that everybody gets where they need to be, make sure that you, you, you don't rent Fiats, you rent Jeeps, you know, because you get stuck in the desert, and, uh, high center, but anyway, as we go through the pictures, I'll, I'll kind of uh, elaborate on some of those things. So the thing about Rothenberg, and if you look at this book, um, but some of his other books too, he had really interesting both you know, scholarly books, but they were also you know, lavishly illustrated, and his words, you, know, you hear a lot of archaeological reports and they're just dry, and this happened here, and this strata demonstrates this, but he has got a, a very good kind of prose that he explains all these things with. So, just a, a really amazing author, and um, our current director was uh, sort of a, a protege of his, and um, was was able to kind of almost get the torch passed on to him um, from from Rothenberg. And there's been uh, a lot of collection of uh, essays and some of his his unpublished works. Um, he also did a lot in Spain in the Rio Tinto region um, with silver mining. Uh, in the Roman period, and a lot of that hasn't even been published yet. So, uh, just a very, very interesting guy. Um, he, as he was developing his skills with Gluck, uh, he decided that he would kind of take what he, he learned. In 1956, he went and did a survey of the uh, Sinai Peninsula. So, that, again, a, a survey is pretty much going out over a vast amount of country and looking for for interesting things that you might want to come back to and things that you might want to bring specialists back to to actually you know, kind of create a dig. And so that was his, his first survey was the Sinai. But um, the southern deserts of, of Israel really became his focus. Um, he actually was the guy that coined the term archaeometallurgy and we'll hear a lot about that today uh, as we go through there because um, his protege, Eris Ben Yosef, who was, who's the current director, um, that was really his, his discipline, and so um, he was really a, a pillar of kind of the new methodology of archaeology called archaeometry, and archaeometry is a multidisciplinary approach dedicated to the application of analytical methods from the natural and exact sciences. And that's, that's a mouthful, but uh, as I go through here, we'll really, ex really explain um, a lot of the people that I worked with were specialists in, in their fields, and um, pretty much part of, well, Tony kind of wanted me to, to kind of go about the, the nuts and bolts and how the dig worked and what our day was like and that sort of thing, but uh, after, after dinner and after we'd gotten ourselves cleaned up, we'd go back to the, 
um, the kind of the cafeteria convention center um, area and have uh, uh, lectures from the, the graduate students. And so the very you know, diverse disciplines of these graduate students, um, this is kind of the, the heart of this archaeometry idea that you're using uh, multiple, multiple disciplines, you know, whether it be you know, um, paleobotany, geology, engineering, all of these things just all, all fitting together to get a real, you know, I would say, multi-dimensional picture of what the archaeological dig is producing rather than just, well, it's some rocks on the ground and they're in layers. So it's, it's, just really, it's just really, really cool. And I think that it's really been great for, for Timna because there's so many different things to, to learn about there. And we'll, I'll kind of go over those. So um, he was initially um, kind, of, kind of excited about uh, the, the, the possibility of this being uh, Solomon's mind. But um, as, as his, as Gluck, his, his kind of uh, patron and, and mentor had, had thought. But then he found probably what he was most famous for uh, excavating was the Egyptian Hathor Temple. And Hathor was uh, a goddess in the, the, the pantheon of, of Egyptian gods, and she was the, the, the patron goddess of miners. And so she had a temple there because the you know, miners have always been a very suspicious and superstitious lot. And so uh, if you can get supernatural help, uh, it's very, very important to keep yourself safe underground. So um, the Hathor temple um, started to cause him to question his mentor, mentor Gluck's King Solomon's Mines Theory. And um, as he excavated that temple, he dated the site to the 13th century BC. And so that would have been the time of around Ramses II through Ramses III. And back in the 1980s, this was, was very, this was when the, the park of Tim was, was starting to be developed. And so in the, the 80s, we had you know, things like the walk like an Egyptian and um, that sort of thing. So as you come into Timna, there's still these very like Disney, plasticky, you know, Egyptian figures in the desert. And um, you know, because that was, they're like, well, I guess it's an Egyptian site, so that's what we're going to promote it as. So, um, but then, and I'll talk more about it too, that in the 1990s, they started, they started doing more precise radiocarbon dating and it extended the time, time frame and um, to the time of the United Monarchies, so King David and King Solomon. So then they started to say, oh, well, okay, well, this, this is Israel, so um, we're going to focus on you know, kind of promoting this idea. And so one of the very interesting things that's here at the Timna Park is an exact scale replica of the tabernacle that the Israelites moved around uh, with them to be the, the dwelling place of God while they were out in the, the desert. So I'll, I'll show you some pictures of that. So it's kind of shifted to that. Um, so that being said, uh, Rothenberg was really the first to correctly tie together and interpret the, the mine shafts, which are kind of up against the, the base of the cliffs with the, uh, the smelting areas which were usually on, on little flat top mesas, um, also hills, um, and I'll explain that some of the very earliest ones, they actually put the furnaces up on the tops of the hills where the wind would come whistling down this rift valley and accelerate as they went up to the, the, the brim of the rock and they would blow on the furnaces. So this is long before the bellows were invented or anything like that. So the very earliest, early bronze um, period uh, areas were actually actually made use of the wind to um, to fire the, the furnaces. So, um, but the Hathor Temple was really just kind of a, a, a kind of the, the masterpiece of his his whole uh, career. Um, it yielded eleven thousand small finds. Um, this temple was actually later uh, repurposed by the Midianites uh, in their religion. And um, it's still, it's very interesting. You still have the, the original walls. You have niches where little idols could have been placed in the rock. And then also way up in the rock, there's, and there's actually a metal staircase that goes up to it. There's a um, petroglyph that has Ramses III, and he's making an offering to, to Hathor. So it's two figures facing each other. And I, 
I wish I could have gone up and like rubbed charcoal into the into the into the, the scratchings because it's just really hard to see. Um, but it's you you can see it, and uh, it's just um, just you know really interesting to kind of tie that together with that time. But as things moved moved forward, um, and they discovered that there had been a lot more activity in the, in the time of the United Monarchy. So I was talking about uh, uh, mesas where they would do the smelting. So there's a place called Slaves Hill, and that was left mostly untouched by Rothenberg. And everybody was asking, well, why did why did you save this place? And he saved it, as he said, to the next generation um, with new methodologies and technologies. And it was very it was actually a very shrewd thing. For him to do because now we have uh, a lot of techniques that he did not have in the 1950s and so and of course it's just it's just great because that is where some of the um, a lot of the, the um, textiles that we found have, have been on Slaves Hill and I'll talk more about that but uh, the thing about the air of the desert is that it's being one of the driest places on earth it's great for, for preservation um, sometimes you know, on a, on a wet year, you might get 30 millimeters of rain. So, um, and I was actually there for a rainstorm and a rainbow on my second day. So pretty interesting, but it's just, yeah, it's a very, very, very dry spot, and, but really good for, for preservation. So the um, Central Tinder Valley Project is what the official name of the dig is. It really commenced in 2012, even though uh, it didn't have a full dig season until 2013. Erez Ben Yosef was a, a young lecturer from Tel Aviv University. Uh, he'd gone to school at the University of California, San Diego, and um, he was just he was just looking for something to do in his his field of, of archaeometallurgy. He, he didn't he didn't want to have all kinds of uh, you know discrepancies and paradigm shifts and all this stuff that ended up ha ha happening. But it's been very interesting, so as you'll see as I go on through this. So um, he came and with, with uh, UC San Diego in 2009 and uh, started examining the sites around the Hathor Temple. Um, but the smelting camps were of uh, extreme interest to him because of his metallurgy uh, interests. And uh, they used high precision carbon dating and uh, archaeomagnetic dating. And, Archaeomagnetic dating is, is really, really interesting because uh, we know that the poles of the Earth move and shift and the, the power, the, the strength of the magnetic field kind of waxes and wanes. And if you have something that reaches a molten state, a metallic substance that reaches a molten state, you can actually find the particles in that molten state line up to, to true north like or magnetic north, just like little little compass needles. Just like you can take a floating leaf and put a, a pin on it and it'll, it'll find magnetic north. So this is a really interesting dating method. And uh, again, he's a specialist in it. Um, it's, it's become um, a really interesting tool um, for locking in dates because of this different, both the movement of the pole and also the, the strength and the, um, the polarity. So because every, not really in archaeological times, but in you know geologic times, the poles actually will shift, and so um, things like uh, basaltic rocks, you can find what which way the poles were were at the time that those rocks were formed. So um, as they re-examined this, um, some of these smelting camps uh, with high precision carbon dating, um, the slag and uh, exhibited these archaeomagnetic. Um, features, and so they were able to firmly date the site to the period of the Israeli United Monarchy, so the 11th through the 9th century BC. Um, site 34, it Slaves Hill, Givat Ha'avadim in Hebrew, um, and it was named by that by, by Gluck um, because they thought, wow, they've got fences here where you get up on this mesa. Uh, they, they've you know, obviously they were trying to keep these people in. Well, actually they were trying to keep other people out. And they determined, because of some of the things they found up there, that, um, that the, the, they weren't slaves. They were highly skilled craftsmen. They were treated very well. They, they got the, the best of everything. So I, I kind of liken it to 
foundry workers in Armani suits, you know, eating the, the very best <laughs> steak and everything that they could get. So the, the smelters actually had a very, they were very well off um, because of their skills and because of just the inherent value of, of the copper. So um, some of the mining areas I was mentioning, they're off kind of far away from the smelting areas and they lack material culture. Uh, very little remains, um, they're just holes in the ground. And so to date these places, they turn to something called optically stimulated luminescence, OSL, and it has to do with electrons trapped in uh, crystalline structure, in things like quartz and feldspar, and it's, it's really technical, but it's really neat because they can, they can see where the, uh, the rocks were exposed. They put it through this scope, that analyzes pretty much when, when it was exposed by the degradation of these electrons and that sort of thing. So that's one of those things that we now have that they didn't have in the 1950s. So, um, like I was saying about the master students project, you know, this, was, this was really interesting because on the, the dig, we really had, our director had his primary objectives. And his uh, primary objectives, let me see if I can, Say, say what it was, is to address uh, major concerns and questions in the metallurgical development of the Southern Levant, or something, something of that is, is the, the primary objective, and that is Erz Ben Yosef's primary objective. But there's a lot of secondary objectives, because there's all these specialists, and they're interested in having, um, you know, things, you know, proving things or disproving things in, in their field, whether their field is textiles, um, archaeobotany, you know, engineering, there's, there's a lot of these, these other disciplines that have these kind of uh, secondary objectives. And a lot of these master students had these projects, and so, like I was saying, they would put on a little class after, after dinner where they would kind of talk about their, their pet projects. And a lot of these master students were also the area supervisors, so um, Dr. Ben Yosef would, would say, okay, you guys need to go to this side or this side, and he kind of bounced around and, you know, he was kind of like the, the three ring circus ringmaster, you know, keeping everything going. And um, the area supervisors and then their assistant area supervisors would, would really do the, the kind of the day-to-day uh, -day recording, the stratigraphy, the locus, loci, lo, loci, <laughs> as, as they go down through the, uh, the layers and um, taking samples, and that was really important was taking samples and some of, the, some of the samples there was a real methodology for, especially bone and charcoal were extremely valuable. You couldn't contaminate them with the oils from your fingers because they were um, potential samples for carbon-14 dating. So those, um, those things were, were very important and um, the secondary objectives um, were really, really pretty much every, every area supervisor had their secondary objectives of things that they were interested in. And the first area that I was in is a place called Crocodile Rock, and uh, yeah, one of the guys would sing the whole Elton John song. Every time he it. I won't. I will spare you that. So, um, but this young man named Mark Cavanaugh, um, he is uh, from Jersey City, New Jersey, um, but he has uh, traveled to Israel and has actually has been a student. Uh, he's kind of like one of those professional students. Um, we called him the absent-minded professor because he'd come down. And, why did I come down here? And then he'd go back up the mountain, and then he'd come back down and go. But I, and some of the other graduate students said, "Yeah, Mark, he and he 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 wore he, he had his lucky lucky excavation jeans, which were just ragged, and just just a very quirky character." But um, they they said, "Yeah, he's he's kind of like the creepy guy that hangs out in the basement, and you go and, and give him samples and, and that sort of thing." But when he got out on the dig, he was just like. He was just like a kid in a candy store. So um, really, really brought out some interesting uh, you know, characteristics once you got him out into the field. But his specialty was dendrochronology. And dendrochronology and um, the identification of trees and also using uh, tree rings to date things. And that's what dendrochronology really is. But um, he was also very interested in what the woods that were used for the smelting, because out in the middle of the desert, you had very few things. Here, here are date palms, and those are actually imported because 
the, the oasis of Kenya, I'll talk about it a little bit later, one of the very few places that actually has running water, but, um, and that's pretty much the only uh, agricultural crop in the southern Arava is the date palm. Mm -hmm. But um, not, not native to there. Um, so the, the tree species he was really interested in was the acacia, and of course we know that from from the Africa, African plains, the Serengeti. Um, the acacia here are kind of, actually kind of stunted and not, not nearly as happy as they would be on the Serengeti. Mm -hmm. But they are uh, a keystone species. Um, they have a whole kind of uh, ecosystem that develops around them. Um, they can become, they can live up to 200 years old. Um, they're really sacred to the Bedouin because if that's like, unless you absolutely have to cut one down, I mean, you don't because they're, sometimes they're the only shade. Um, there's a whole, like I was saying, the whole ecosystem, um, the acacia gazelle, uh, the gazelles will come and the, the males, it's almost like a, a bower bird, you know, that fixes up a nice little nesting site to impress the ladies, like, come on in, this is the place. And, you know, because the little gazelle, he'll be like, I own this whole tree. And, you know, and so he'll have this whole area, and of course, the, they, the manure from, from them, fertilizes the tree, which causes the tree to have more shade, which makes a better place for the baby gazelles to be born. So, um, a very interesting kind of uh, ecology. And the acacia gazelles, the actual acacia gazelles are down to around two, less than 200 individuals um, because it's just because of, you know, jackals and other, other things that get them, the highway, that sort of thing. There's a common gazelle, and the common gazelle were actually fairly fairly common <laughs> there, and we see them a lot. But the acacia gazelles, where the early bronze site where we were, there was a fenced area that was actually a, a preserve that was dedicated strictly to the acacia gazelle. So, uh, Mark's uh, other, other kind of uh, studied trees um, was the eshe in Hebrew, which is the tamarisk. Um, also the white room, we hear, you know, recognize that from, from the, the Bible. Um, as a common tree that grows out in the um, in the wilderness, the uh, pistacea, which is a, a type of juniper, like a cedar type tree, and so he was really interested. Whenever we found charcoal, he's like, "Ooh, charcoal, charcoal!" And so, and you know, we were very careful not 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 to touch it, to you know, pick it up with some clean metal metal uh, device and put it right into a, a sealed little plastic envelope, so he could do the the dating and. The species identification on it. So um, he had really come to recognize that uh, the wood and getting the wood to the smelting area was a limiting factor. And there were times where they had identified that um, things had become so de deforested and it was it was too much work to try to bring it up, up, up the Mediterranean coast, through the Judean mountains and the Negev Desert, down into this area um, to make it, you know, it was, it was a it was, it was just not a feasible factor because they had to move this stuff in. He also studied uh, charcoal, if they were making the charcoal somewhere else, but they realized that charcoal just doesn't travel well. It just, on the back of a donkey, it just, yeah, it turns just to powder. So they pretty much were, it was, it was definitely a limited factor on how much they could do in this area. So, um, some of these people, they just, they just gave a presentation or a class, but some of them, um, if, if we were able to, to take and do a practical exercise, uh, it was very, very interesting to do. And Ebar Meyerson, that was a, a master's student at Tel Aviv University, she's an archaeotechnologist, so her uh, field was um, reproducing, analyzing and reproducing the furnaces that they used to, to smelt the, the copper ore. And, um, she, one, one afternoon in the evening, they said, you get to go out with Imar if you want and go, go collect um, uh, little copper nodules. And it's like, well, this feels so wrong, it's a national park. And it's like, it's okay, we've got permission to do it. So we went out to one of the, the canyons right at the, the, the bottoms of the cliffs and we got to pick up the copper, copper nodules. And then a few months later, she recreated one of the kind of terracotta furnaces, and just out there on the quad at Tel Aviv University, they reproduced the 7,000-year-old um, technology of, re of 
being able to melt and smelt the, uh, the, the copper with this, um, with this technology. So very interesting that we actually got to go out and, um, and collect the ore so she could you know, recreate this whole, whole process. And I mentioned melting and smelting, so there was really a, a two-phase process. So the, the melting was taking the, the nodules, and like I was saying, that they're in kind of a, a white. The copper is interspersed into kind of a, a light-colored sandstone. And so you basically pulverize this. You melt it first, and then that gets it into a, into a more metallic form. Then you heat it again, so you're actually making a a crust or like I was mentioning the prills which are like little little VBs of, of copper so it's really a it really sees sees fire twice in in the process of going from ore into actual copper so the guy that was kind of had to be everybody's everybody's hero and go-to guy uh, was Joab Vaknin um, he was the dig administrator so he was the guy that like I said if you needed coffee he went to him. If you needed to know who was going to give you a ride somewhere, you went to him. Um, I, I was talking to him before I even, well, right after I signed up for the dig, you know, asking him where I could stay in Tel Aviv, who was going to give me a ride to the site, you know, all of this stuff. Um, so he, very interestingly, comes from a very old uh, Hebrew family. His family has lived in the same house in Jerusalem for 13 generations in the old city. And you go through the old city and there's just these these tiny little, they're almost like rooms, they're not even really like houses in these, you know, this labyrinth of, of um, little streets and everything through through the old city of Jerusalem. And then he has seven kids. So I don't know if he just hangs them on pigs on the wall, but his kids, the kids were delightful. We, we loved, loved the kids and his wife was there too. And they were they were all over all over the place and helping helping move over burden and run the sifting tables and all, all of this stuff. So um, Yoav's kids were very very um, very fun to be on the dig with and um, a, a great little labor source. So um, he has really focused his career and is focusing his career on archaeomagnetism. Um, his primary work site is a place called the Gavani site. Uh, it's set south of the Temple Mount. It had been a, a parking lot where they used to par park um, tourist buses so people could go to the Temple Mount in the old city. And then they started to realize that there was all kinds of really interesting um, archaeology under it, which is pretty much the story in all, all of uh, Jerusalem, but it was one of the very few places that was a, an urban vacant lot. So it didn't have something built on top of it. So they were able to start digging into that and um, they, uh, the, the most dramatic part of it, they found a destruction layer which was 2.3 meters deep. So ash and rock tumbled down on everything and said, well, this is something big. And um, it was the Babylonian destruction. So that is the destruction that um, after King Zedekiah defied uh, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, he came in and um, just destroyed destroyed the temple, destroyed the walls, destroyed all pretty much all of all of Jerusalem. And the really interesting thing is that we know that it was in August 568 BC. So we know from the Babylonian records, um, which they kept very good records of like, you mess with us, we're gonna take you out. And then of course the 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 Hebrew records, like you know, we know that this is the time that they came and they destroyed our city and took all of our you know, upper class people into the, the Babylonian captivity. So we we know it, and it's it's possible that we, they even know the the date. I don't remember what day in August it was, but the thing is that with the um, archaeomagnetism, they use this as a benchmark that they can look at the the melted metals inside these buildings and say, okay. Um, we can, we can use this and we can date other things in, in relationship to this. So um, it was uh, recorded in 2 Kings 25.9 um, that they burnt the elite houses. And this house was kind of a, um, it kind of gives me the idea of the, the upper room. It was kind of like a, a, a house on, on the bottom, but a, a big kind of um, you know, banqueting area in the, in the top. It had these massive um, timbers in it. So... Of course, you know, in this in that part of the world, that's that's a luxury item to have timbers in, in big timbers in your house, and um, they 
Yoav, when he learned that I was a firefighter, he's like, well, can you tell me what temperature this would have burned at? And I was like, oh, I wish I could, but you know, because of things like humidity and you know, did they use accelerants? Did they throw straw in there? Did they throw oil on it? Who knows what they did? And so I was a little disappointed in that, um, that I couldn't tell them exactly what temperature because that, that could give, give them a little bit more idea too. But things were you know, pretty, pretty, pretty much destroyed. Um, but that's, that's kind of the story of, of Jerusalem and, and just all of these different layers uh, of, of humanity, really, and their, their, their products. And that is something that um, when we talk about well, Tel Aviv is a, a good example. We, we all, all hear that name. So Tel means hill and Aviv means spring. So it's the, the, a hill with a spring. But they call archaeological mountains Tels um, because they're basically a hill of human habitation. So some of these places that are near rivers, they're just layers and layers and layers, you know, thousands of years of discarded pottery. You find destruction layers where somebody came in and destroyed it, burnt the city. You, you find, you know, people came in, may have reused the stone in, to their own, own use. Um, it's really interesting, too, because you'll see a lot of... Uh, Icons and, and you know, religious stones that were reused, like um, maybe they had been in a synagogue, then they were put into a Byzantine church, then they were put into a mosque, and you know they were they were reused over the years because they were pretty. So they had you know architectural features. So that was a, that was very interesting to talk to him and kind of learn uh, how this archaeomagnetism was being applied uh, at a very very interesting and very significant dig that they dated to the Babylonian destruction. So um, Asafa Samar was a guy that, he was actually local. There were, uh, on the outside of Timna, there's two uh, kibbutzes, which are um, Israeli settlements, and um, he lived in one, but he became very interested in some of the things in that area, and um, of course, he was just a couple miles from the dig, so he was a regular feature, and became, even though he was probably in his early 60s, he was uh, getting his master's from Tel Aviv University. But the thing that really interested him was something called desert kites, and they kept saying, oh, Asaf's going to take us out and, and show us the desert kites. And we're like, well, is it a little bird, or is it, you know, are we going to go out and fly kites in the desert? And we were completely baffled by what this meant, you know, those of us that were, weren't clued in. But... Um, it turns out that these are actually rock formations that are on the ground, and they were first discovered by the um, British Royal Air Force, um, probably in the 1920s or 30s, um, when they were flying between um, Amman and um, Egypt. And they, the reason they're called desert kites is because of their shape. So they're rock walls that are on the ground. They're uh, usually a diamond. Uh, the diamond doesn't quite close on one end, and it has two long wings or kind of like strings that come out from the back of it. And so for a long time they were just, just completely baffled as to what in the world these things could be. And, you know, they started looking at them on the ground and um, tr just trying to figure out, you know, what, what the purpose of these, these things were. So um, they could be up to two to three kilometers long, too. And so it was, uh, it was interesting because he made the, the, the point um, when we went out to look at these um, was anything that they don't understand that they say it's a cult. So obviously, you know, it, it was some kind of, you know, it had some, you know, supernatural um, type of, of, of purpose. Um, but after they started to really study it on the ground, what they found out was that these things were actually uh, hunting devices for herding the gazelles. And they would have uh, these long, almost things, almost like corrals. Um, before, I, before I really go into that, they, some people actually thought they were corrals for domesticated animals. You know, other people had thought that maybe they were Roman forts. Um, but the walls are, I mean, you step over them. So it's not, not like a big deal. But um, that's, that's an interesting thing, too, because we, we, those of us that weren't familiar with it said, well, won't, won't the, the, the gazelles just step over the wall? But it's kind of like if you ever see a sheep and it's running and it sees something on the ground, like a shadow or something, it'll jump it. It'll jump really high over it because it... It doesn't know what it is. But these gazelles, once you got them running, if they saw something, even though they could have physically jumped right over it, they started being herded into these corrals or off a little little cliff, and then they would get them with spears or bows and arrows and 
you know, herding them into just a pretty much a kill zone. And another thing that, that took them a while because they couldn't find any bones, so they took the entire gazelle and butchered it somewhere off site. So, um, very interesting thing to learn about, um, and uh, learning kind of about the, the archaeozoology and the, the different varieties of, of animals. Um, and they discovered through the archaeozoology that the, um, the gazelles had actually been completely wiped out one, at one point, and so it was either the, the people that were using these did very well, but it was most likely in conjunction with the mining that all of the acacias, which is their keystone species, had been destroyed, so they didn't have a good place to raise their families and, and find shelter and that sort of thing. But then, as the trees came back, the acacia gazelles came, came back as well. Um, Marcin Gomrat, um, very interesting young Polish guy. Um, he uh, was an expert in pottery from 3,350 BC to 3,200 BC. And uh, it was something, he, 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 it was, he was a fun guy. He, he, his English was not very good, but he'd say, he, we'd say, oh, Marcin, there's no sugar. He's like, but I like sugar. <laughs> and, um, and he would say, I'm looking for the pajama wear. And we're like, what? What are you looking for? Pajama wear. And we're like, can you explain this? He's like, it's striped like pajamas. And it's like, okay. So it was a type of pottery that was a red and white pottery with stripes, so almost like a candy cane. And so it was called pajama wear um, in, his, in his parlance. And, um, but the thing was that it was a very specific to this, this period in the third century or third millennium BC. And if you found this, it would establish cultural and chronological horizons. So cultural horizons basically meaning that the culture that was using it stopped being present. And then also the time period in, in, in a stratigraphy section, you would know that that, that was the end of an era, basically, when they stopped using this, this type of pottery. So that was his, his area of expertise. Um, Chadash Bagdazan was a, uh, a young Turkish guy. Um, he was uh, into archaeoclimatology. And what his, his I, you know, in, he was, like I said, he was from Turkey. He was trying to take some of the things that he learned, mainly on the island of Cyprus. That was where he, he kind of come up in the archaeological field. Um, there's a lot of copper mining there too, but his, his thing was looking at mega droughts, and the mega drought that he was most interested in happened 4,200 years ago, and all over the Middle East there was a decline or collapse of civilizations during this, this mega drought. So a lot of the, especially nomadic people, couldn't make it anymore. Um, on Cyprus it was really pronounced because Cyprus being an island, it was, it was really hard to, to move away. Um, Mesopotamia, was, it wasn't so bad because they have the Tigris and Euphrates rivers there, which are just massive rivers, and so it wasn't felt so, so badly in some places, but um, a very good example of a uh, civilization decline or collapse in this country, and the kind of the correlating um, stability factor is the Rio Grande and the, the ancestral pueblos that lived out in the Four Corners area. They no longer had the ability to, uh, to farm the bottoms of those canyons. Um, they couldn't raise their, their corn and squash and beans because they didn't have a constant water supply, so they had to move to the Rio Grande. Same thing with the, the civilizations that thrived were along the Tigris and Euphrates, also the Nile. The Nile is a, a great example of that too. But a lot of these kind of marginal uh, civilizations um, and, um, and also uh, tribes, they just couldn't make it through these mega droughts. And so there were also two other uh, mega droughts that he studied. One was 8,200 years ago, one was 5,200 years ago. But as far as kind of correlating it with um, everything that was on the ground at Timna, um, as far as the early Bronze Age um, development that, that we were seeing, um, he, was, he was very interested in, in you know, kind of um, tying that into his, his research, what we, were, what we were seeing there on the ground. So um, there was a, a brand new student at Tel Aviv University. Her name was Romina de la Casa, and she was uh, uh, Argentine-Italian, um, but she had just been accepted at the master's program, 
but her area of expertise was uh, the Hittites. And the Hittites, we've, we've known about them for a long, long time, um, but we have not been able to really decipher a lot of their culture. And um, they were just, they were just really kind of a, a very, almost like a shadow empire, um, mainly in, in Anatolia, Turkey, um, up through the top of the, the, the Middle East. So um, we really didn't know a lot about them, but recent discovery and translation, a lot of, with a lot of their um, sort of um, religious, uh, almost like liturgy, I would say. Um, this is something that they call the Mugawar, and they're evocation rituals. So you're, you're asking for something to happen, and they are finding out that these are actually ritual songs, and they were songs that they would sing to make the gods come back to their temples or the land. So this is one of those, those seasonal change type of things that they would, uh, they would explain the changing of the seasons and that sort of things. You know, the, the winter comes, it meant the gods left, but you'd have to go out and sing them back. And so it was very interesting. So she, she was learning how to sing songs that probably hadn't been sung for 3,000 years. So that's, that was very, very interesting. Um, Sarah Richardson, um, she was from um, Canada, but um, she was starting to apply a lot of the new methodologies in mapping with differential GPS. Um, differential GPS, it, the, the X's and Y axes are very accurate. The Z, so the, the elevation, still not perfect, but it's still a lot better than, than having to go out and, and physically measure a lot of these things in really rough country. So with that, we're seeing greater accuracy with uh, complex site mapping, and some of these sites, the production sites especially, um, were in, in rugged country, there were a lot of different, different smaller um, excavation sites. And so with, with these sorts of new um, technologies, again, it goes back to, uh, to Rothenberg leaving, leaving uh, a lot of this work for the new methodologies and new technologies. And so now we're able to, able to apply this. So I'm going to take a quick break and have some water. Um, does anybody have any questions so far? All right. Seeing that, we will proceed with the slides. So, um, I was talking about uh, the Arafat Desert being extremely dry. The area around Timna is, is a national park. Um, it has been a national park since, I believe, the 70s. And it was about that time that uh, the very last modern effort at extracting copper was done by a Mexican company. And they had dug large modern pit, pits and shafts into the hillside here, but they came up with huge amounts of water. And so they had to drain the, drain the, the mines. And so they, it, the, the, the oasis of Timna, is, it's about 30 to 40 years old. But it's because of all this, this water that was inside the mines that um, they, they brought out and um, they, it, it's a place that they can grow um, date palms now, and it's, it's really the headquarters of the park. Uh oh. No. Oh. We'll go set that up. I don't know. <laughs> I pushed the forward button. So, but anyway, I'll tell you a little bit more about, about the park. So, um, the. Uh, I've got this, this, this nifty map here, too. Um, so, it's really. it's. What they're kind of pushing for now um, is to kind of be the, the, the Moab of Israel. So they're really pr promoting the, uh, the mountain biking, the, the Trans-Israel Trail, which goes all the way from the Golan Heights all the way to the Red Sea, um, passes through there. And um, uh, the town of Alat, which is it's only about a 70-year-old town, it's on the Gulf of Aqaba. So the city of Aqaba ended up being in Jordan. And so Israel wanted to have a port city on the that spur of the Red Sea, so they built, built the town of a lot, but it's, it's a beautiful town. Um, it's got uh, a lot of uh, very, it's got a really neat botanical gardens, it's got a lot of uh, underwater reefs, dolphins, you know, a lot of really interesting you know, aquatic life and that sort of thing, so they're kind of promoting this as something else to, you know, instead of just you know, sitting on the beach, you know, you can go 29 miles and see all of this other stuff for rent mountain bikes and, and that sort of thing. 
So this is the, the crocodile rock, and uh, this is where um, Mark Cavanaugh, who's, who's standing, standing here, um, he is assigning us our, our dig sites. And a few years before, they'd done a survey, and he used a drone to do the survey of, of these pretty inaccessible areas. And um, so this is something that, that Luke and Rothenberg had, had not discovered, because it was just, they, well, they had a, just a, a, a plethora of things on the ground that they, they could look at. So some of the things that were a little bit more uh, inaccessible were, were passed over, but uh, they found them with a the drone. And the thing that is kind of the, the big contrast here is you have all this nice red sandstone that is the, the, the bedrock, but a lot of this um, more volcanic, darker stone, and the way it cleaves off in kind of, um, kind of block shapes, that was used for, for building. So a lot of the, the um, smelting structures and also the habitations were built with this, this dark rock. So it was very easy as we went through. Um, we could see what, what was new and what was old and you know, what they brought in. So there were um, sort of deposits of this, this dark rock, but whenever you saw this dark rock, you knew that there was something, something close. So this is when we finally got to our our, um, our dig site and got our, our meter square uh, designated. Um, this, is, this is what it looked like. So it was a lot of rock that had come down in, um, from rains and that sort of thing during, during the, the centuries. Something they call less, which is like a, a really fine sand that blows in either from the Arabic Desert or from the uh, Sahara Desert. And so that's something that always has to be uh, dusted off um, before you get down into anything. So this is a, a, a sheltered um, smelting workshop, and you can see up through here, we, we definitely see a wall, and again, the telltale sign is that they use the dark rock to make, make structures, and we really wanted to see what, what all we could find in here. Uh, again, Mark was you know, really hoping that we could find bone or charcoal for, for him to analyze and get a good carbon date off of, but also, um, you could tell a lot about um, the slag that you'd find. If it was small, you knew that it was really old because the, the furnaces initially were very, very small. Um, by the time the, the, the Muslims were doing it in the seven, 700s and 800s, the, the slag was the size of dinner plates because they had progressed the, to a much more industrial scale of, of building. That's just looking out kind of across the valley. So you can see it's, it's you know, really, really pretty high. This is my dig partner, Summer Shives. Um, she was from the University of North Carolina, and she's now uh, a curator at the Space Museum in Huntsville, Alabama. So kind of a, a long ways from archaeology, but at least it's, it's history. So a much more recent rocket archaeology, I guess you'd say. Um, so there, there she's looking very perplexed about you know, where, the, where, where do we start? Um, because we want to do a very nice uh, stratigraphy, work our way down through the material. Um, of course, always looking for, yes, counterintuitive. Um, okay, uh, again, in another of these just really neat alcoves that were in the red sandstone. Um, so very, very nice places to kind of make, make natural shelters. It just, you know, really easy to get the dark stone. Like I said, it kind of naturally comes off in these slabs and blocks. And then these alcoves in the red sandstone, uh, you can make really nice um, just habitations or, or workshops in. And so this is kind of, I think this is one of the next layer up we're looking at. And again, just looking at kind of what, what we had to start with. So we had started, and you'll see our string line here, and we're just trying to look for um, just fire pits, just any, any kind of uh, artifacts inside the, the square. And it was one of those things, you know, uh, an area supervisor loves a, a good cross cut. And so wherever your string is, you want to have a nice cross cut because you get to see all the, the stratigraphy as you work your way down. And in this material, you know, if you could come up with a, a nice, nice cross section, oh, that was golden, but um, very hard to do. And you, know, you get almost there and you're like, oh, that's sticking out. And you chip it in a whole bunch of, 
of loose stuff and falling. You think, oh, why did I do that? So we had an area kind of around the, the far side where we take our, our overburden. So after we'd gone through the materials and um, you know, identified, most generally we were finding uh, slag and occasionally we'd find chunks of ore, but it was, it was mostly slag. Um, they, if, if they had brought the materials all the way from the cliffs over here on the other side up to this smelting point, they wanted to, to get pretty good um, you know, pretty good reduction of all the, the ores that they had. So to kind of, you know, clean everything up, and a lot of it was that, that really fine dust, we, we kind of went around the corner here and dumped our stuff off. Um, so this is one of the, the walls that um, has been there for 4,300 years at least. Um, and actually the next site we, we went to was even older. Um, just very interesting, there's, there's some chunks of slag here in the wall. Uh, some of the, the rock that had just come off of the, the cliff and kind of filled in in the wall over the centuries. So we're starting to get somewhere here. We're starting to get things cleaned out. Um, you'll see we've got the, the trowel here. And so the trowel, very handy for doing those cross sections that I was talking about. You get a good, nice, nice cut. Um, whenever you get into something that you, you want to keep the more solid materials, the little, little broom is good. And then we had the, this these little square, um, kind of like a dustpan, but also kind of like a, a shovel. It was just like a little little square dustpan that was made out of, of tin, and that was one of the, the tools that we used a lot just to, to clean things up. So this is a real nice piece of slag, and especially for this era, um, most in this era, they were probably using blow tubes, so occasionally we'd find uh, a little piece of uh, ceramic, so it was pretty much they'd use like a, a straw or a reed, and they would have a piece of ceramic on the end so it wouldn't burn, and they would blow right into the into the furnaces. Mm -hmm. So this was after the period where they were using using the wind to um, to stoke the furnaces, and before they used uh, the bellows. The bellows had not been identified or in, invented yet. So this is after we pretty much cleaned up our square. You can see uh, we're some are standing there. You can see our, our uh, grid square line, and Mark has got this uh, uh, total station, which is, is giving us the um, the new layer of our, our, our stratigraphy as we went down. So that's just looking out towards um, out towards the Dead Sea to the north. Again, you can kind of get an idea of, of how big this building was. It was not really big enough to be comfortable. <laughs> so once they had uh, some of the rocks and that sort of thing in there to sit on as they were processing the ore, and then when they were firing things, it was it was pretty pretty tight quarters. So here's pretty much the completed completed square, and uh, we pretty much have gotten down to the bedrock. You see that kind of pink sandstone. You see there that little shovel uh, dustpan device I was talking about. And of course the, the rubber buckets, the rubber buckets were, were great because you could very easily toss them and you can make chains of, of uh, you know, like a bucket brigade to clean out areas. So again, just a kind of a, a final product right there. And there's like the real final product when everything was pretty much cleaned out down to bedrock. Um, so the, here's a picture of uh, the cliffs to the west and the most of the mining area is that mesa that's got the sun on it. Most of the, the copper mines are right at the base of that mesa. And this is actually from the, the Timna Oasis. There's this uh, very interesting sphinx looking rock out here and it's very, very easy to believe that it might be a, a man-made sphinx but it's actually a natural formation. And, um, but it's the, the main road comes in. Um, you can see some acacia trees out here with their flat tops. So this is at the, uh, the, the main um, visitor center. So this is the replica of the tabernacle. So um, we ha had very good um, descriptions. I think it was in numbers or it may have been, may have been Exodus. Uh, when they, they describe exactly how the, the, what the exact, you know, by the cubit 
um, what the exact measurements for the, the tabernacle were going to be. And, um, and hmm? Deuteronomy? Okay. Um, but the yeah, point, point being, it's, it's very neat to have a, a very interesting, <coughs> a very exact uh, scale replica. And we were staying right next to it. This is kind of, kind of a permanent tent building, and that was what we stayed in. We had, uh, each of us had our own kind of bed and little, little, little area, but it was just kind of one, one big open room. It had a, a hard roof, but it had canvas walls. So we got, here's here's the the tabernacle. I went out one one morning, and so it's got the the bronze altar, and so that's really neat because the uh, the, the bronze altar and the, the bronze sea, which the uh, bronze sea was just a, a big um, copper basin, you know, very very fitting for it. You know, not only was this the wilderness where the the uh, Hebrews wandered, but also you think, well, where did they get bronze in the desert to make these things? Well. Um, this would have been this would have been the place. So back to the dig, kind of working our way up into uh, another another site. Very interesting to get down to these walls um, and just see how much the uh, the sediments have kind of packed into them over the years. Um, here is the mountain biking trail that we were overlooking, and occasionally these people would. Be overcome with curiosity and, and go off. What, what are you doing? Like, oh, sit down. We'll tell you. So sometimes we had had captive audiences there, so it was, it was kind of fun if they if they came up there. So this is uh, Slaves Hill. So this was the the main site. I was mentioning this is the site that um, Rothenberg decided to to let the next generation study, and it was the, the um, a major site. Um, this was the site of the, a very interesting discovery really two years ago of uh, what they call royal purple cloth. And um, if you'll remember in the Bible, Lydia was a, a seller of purple, and purple cloth was uh, a symbol of the extremely elite or the royal. And it was uh, extremely expensive because it was made from the glands of the murex snail, and it takes a tremendous amount of these glands of these, and it's a sea snail. So they would pull these out, and just a few years ago, um, uh, an Israeli scientist was trying to reproduce the, the technique. The murex snails are now extinct on the, um, the east coast of the Mediterranean, but they're still very plentiful in Italy. And so he went to Italy and actually was doing a lot of his, his uh, research there and was going down it every day to the, the fish market and buying all the murex snails he could. And he was, uh, the, the fishermen were joking with him. It's like, you're saving the part that we throw away and you're throwing away the part that we save. Because he was pulling these little, little colorful, you know, basically ink glands out of these snails and they're throwing all the meat away. Um, just in order to reproduce the, the royal purple. So that was something that, um, as far as the discovery there, um, it was the furthest south it, it had ever been discovered. It was the oldest that had actually ever been discovered. And again, the main factors here are the extreme dryness of the climate was able to preserve that. And then also the fact that these smelters, the people that had the knowledge how to do this, they could basically ask any price. It's like, well, I want the finest clothes. I want the best cuts of meat. You know, if you, if you want me to keep working here. So, so they were far from slaves, but here we are on, on the Slaves Hill, nevertheless. Um, this is kind of the... Uh, the, the high point of the literally of, of Slaves Hill and it looks out towards this next mesa where the Hathor Temple is. So there is the Hathor Temple and these three uh, rock formations in the middle are the <coughs> corners of Solomon and so that's a very uh, prominent landmark. A, a lot of uh, Israeli guidebooks. I've got a book at home that has that on the, the back cover. Um, it's just kind of a, a iconic image of, of the Israeli wilderness. So, um, but that's one of the, the big, <coughs> big tourist sites. You see here the uh, various cars and the tourist buses. And um, here you can just vaguely see the, the outline of, of Hathor and Ramses. And you can just kind of see her arms, but she's sitting there accepting his, his gift. And his gift is really 
you know, that he, he never was actually there himself, but it was just, you know, the representation that he funded this temple for her to, uh, you know, look kindly on the mining and keep the miners safe and, and that sort of thing. And a few years ago, just outside of this area, they found a, um, a, a woman, a skeleton of, a, of an Egyptian woman, and she was pregnant, but um, a not totally um, developed baby. And they looked at some of the materials around her, and it turned out that she was a seer, and she sung in the, the Temple of Hathor. So she was um, very, very interesting. They would bring somebody all the way from Egypt, out here in the middle of the desert, to sing songs to keep Hathor happy, to keep the miners safe. So, uh, very, I mean, just, just, just very interesting. I mean, they, some of, some of the, the, the people that have already, you know, they, they're not really on the dig anymore, um, especially the lady that did the textiles and some of the people that did that. Um, they are publishing this stuff, and it's just, you know, I mean, these are like career building things. It's just, it's just really interesting. You know, a lot more than a lot of people bargain for in this little corner of the desert. So, here's the Hathor Temple. I ex explained a little bit about how. Um, built by the Egyptians, but later repurposed by the Midianites. Um, same sort of idea of, of keeping the miners safe as they were working. Um, you can see the, the uh, niches up here for the sacred statues, and then also the, the paving stones. And to think that this was probably 1400 BC, 1300 BC, and I mean, this is pretty, pretty amazing. And uh, you know, a lot of a lot of places in, in the northern part of Israel, a lot. I was mentioning before that a lot of the rocks are reused for different, you know, repurposed. And it's very interesting that these these rocks are still in their original uh, positions uh, after all this time because there just wasn't wasn't a lot of population here, a lot a lot of uh, salvaging of um, architectural materials. Uh, again, looking up. Um, that up there where that little square is, is actually where the, the inscription is. So somebody had to climb way up there. There is a, a metal staircase so you can go up and see the inscription. Um, but pretty impressive, you know, that they, they put it way, way up there. <laughs> That's uh, Eris Ben Yosef, our, our director. And so he's explaining some of the, um, just, just kind of the general context of, of this temple. Uh, this is the, the goofy uh, swan boats and flamingo boats, and um, again, some of the some of the things are really really kind of uh, tacky and touristy. Um, but this is the the lake that I was telling you about that they had to pump the water out of the mine, and um, the way I understand it, that there was there sections of this part of the country that were actually under glacier um, during the ice age, <laughs> which is hard to believe, but. There's parts of the, the Negev that they are able to have these um, date palm plantations because they have massive amounts of underwater, underground aquifers. Mm -hmm. So you have these, these big giant basins of rock that had been filled in um, with smaller stone. Uh, the glaciers melted into them, and there's this, this huge you know, mm -hmm. water tank. And so some of these uh, kibitzes that are down, down in this absolute, this terrible hot desert, they're able to have these uh, date palm plantations um, because of the, the underground water. And they're very, very careful with it too. So the, uh, um, some of these farms were where the uh, drip irrigation systems were developed just to give it just the perfect amount because you, you try to run it through a ditch or something like that, you know, 80% of it's going to evaporate. Mm -hmm. So this is one of the sites, uh, one of the actual mines where they dug into the rock, and you can see that that kind of bluish green copper hue throughout that sandstone. And if you guys want to come up afterwards and look at the the um, little uh, nodules, so these are almost like the like concentrated form um, that have kind of a hardness, and so when they come out of the sandstone, they they hold up because of the copper that's really kind of sticking them together, whereas a lot of the other Sandstone just kind of um, turns back into sand. Um, again, just looking at some of these caves and then also you know the galleries. So uh, some of them were kind of open. Um, they would kind of open up the hillside as they dug it out. Um, there were also, I believe, something like six thousand straight down shafts, and they were really hard to find because a lot of times they put them adjacent to each other. They take the overburden of one and they just put it into the other one, mm -hmm. and so there were. Once they started looking around and digging, 
they found thousands of these these hmm. mines that were you know three four feet wide, almost perfectly circular. A lot of them you can see the chisel marks, and um, that was where they were doing the uh, optical luminescence. Oh, I said, <laughs> the luminescence mm -hmm. testing um, because they could tell when that was exposed and, and that sort of thing. But uh, a lot of them, yeah, had been had been filled back, filled back up. So here we go. This is a really good example of the chisel marks um, on on the sides, and um, they would just find a really rich kind of vein of it and, and follow it. Here's one of the mm -hmm. the ones I was describing. Very interesting that they would leave these little steps. It was almost like a a, a circular stairway, so you'd have your little toe holes as you went down into it. Um, this is the area where we were uh, collecting the, the little nodules for um, Ingvar's experiment. Um, here is probably a piece of ore. I'm not. I'm not sure, but it, the picture here is really just to kind of show um, what we would how we would record them, we would record the site and, you know, other, other pertinent information, um, the, you know, stratigraphy location of it, and these would get shipped off to um, Tel Aviv University for you know, further analysis. Um, here's just a, a bucket that's full of our, our little specimens of, of the slag and ore and whatever else that we could find. Um, this is looking up at uh, actually a they had maybe in a kind of a watchtower here on this hillside and what we discovered in this area was an entire um, complex with with very clearly a stable because there was a whole bunch of donkey dung in it um, an area that was a workshop um, which was what I excavated uh, probably a residential and food preparation area, um, but it was a very, very rich site. And the other thing that was really cool about the site was this is the, this is the early bronze area. Uh, so this is you know, 3500 BC, um, some of the very first metallurgy that they know of, the first, first efforts at uh, refining metal. And um, this is where they were using the wind as it come, came whistling down this rift valley to fire the furnaces. So this is kind of the, uh, the residential site, um, starting to, to dig there. Um, this, actually no, this is, this is the, uh, the place with the organics. So that was actually where they, they housed their donkeys, most likely. Um, that all of that really fine, fine organics in there was most likely compost from the, the donkeys. And um, so they started finding all these little seeds in there and they couldn't figure it out. And then they figured out that what they fed the donkeys was actually something called pomus, and it is the squeezings of grapes after wine production. Mm -hmm. So you had, it was almost like a, um, a byproduct anyway, um, but it had you know, high sugars, it had um, you know, the fiber of the seeds and that sort of thing was in it. So pretty, pretty good feed for the, for the donkeys, but um, kind of, kind of a, at first a mystery of like, what were they feeding their donkeys? Because you can see there's not a lot of grass there. But this was something that you know was probably more available from um, some of the cities along the Mediterranean where they were producing wines. Um, this is just uh, when we went out and started finding kind of probable locations. Uh, we would mark them and we would do kind of cross sections. And uh, one day we went out, the entire expedition came out and we all stood about arm's length away and we just walked really slowly across this area and um, just dropped little ribbons or tags whenever we saw something and so that was just kind of our uh, survey method of this early bronze area. Um, just looking at kind of the, uh, the landscape, you can see over here there's a, a road and uh, I was telling Tony earlier this was kind of a, it's kind of a blessing and a curse. So in the 1950s um, they were letting foreign companies come in to look at uh, the, the possibility of mining copper with uh, modern methods. And like I said, a Mexican company did come in in the 80s, but uh, they, they put in this road and it just nicked the edge of our, our mm -hmm. um, complex that we were, we were digging out. The tumulus, which was the, the, 
kind of the burial structure was on one side of this road, and where this road ran down into the, the wadi, which is you know, the dry creek bed, um, that was pretty much where the ore, ore um, processing pit was. But the good thing about it was that it <coughs> took things out of context, and so that's how I'm able to have these and not be in antiquities prison. So I was able to take things from this roadway um, that uh, were no longer in context and were no longer um, you know, analytical, as, as it were, because they've, you know, they've lost their context. So this is the, the hill that um, the furnace was on where they used the wind. So um, the, that kind of steep side there is on the north, uh, which is on your left. Um, again, we were just kind of getting an idea of where everything was as far as uh, just spatial relationships of everything in the complex. If you look in this picture over here to the north, um, you see that there's suddenly a lot more acacia, and that is actually the acacia gazelle reserve. So that's all fenced mm -hmm. in to keep jackals and mm -hmm. domestic dogs and anything that might get these uh, acacia gazelles out. But we saw a, n a number of acacia gazelles and um, some, of the, the, some of them were more skittish than others. So some of them would just kind of sit under their trees like, I've got a good tree here, I'm not leaving. <laughs> and uh, you can see that they make great shelter. You know, it's, it's just like a perfect little umbrella for the, the gazelles. What do they eat? Uh, very little. <laughs> yeah. so, um, they, there, there is some vegetation there, but it's mostly going to be bushes, um, like some of the, uh, the, the, the broom, broom bushes. And then whenever you get into the, the wadis, which is from this aspect, it's actually kind of behind us. Um, there's, there are some grasses and that sort of thing, but they're just tiny little things too. They're just, but just very suited to the desert. Again, um, this is a picture from, from the actual hill that has the, the wind-powered um, uh, furnace on it. And again, you see the road and how the road cut through. Um, this is the tumulus, and so it was a burial structure and had uh, really large capstones, but um, I think they, they saw um, myself and uh, Kadash and Marcin, and we were fairly strong, strong young-ish guys, and said, I think we'll go ahead and we'll excavate this until we find find skeletons, and then we'll stop. And so, um, and that's that's really the rule. Um, the uh, um, Israel Antiquities Authority has to be called in if you find human remains, um, and it, a lot of it has to do with the Jewish uh, cemetery type rituals that you're not not supposed to disturb disturb the dead, even though this this was long before there were Jews, <laughs> really, um, because it's 3500 BC. Um, but that was that was the rule, and so we we actually started on the tumulus when we got down to to the bones. Um, we ended up, you know, recording what we found so far, and then backfilling it to protect it until a um, antiquities authority um, anthropologist could come in and actually date date the site. That's the the, the first thing that they really do to uh, to see see when that was from and that sort of thing. Um, this is, is my site. Um, the professor that was in charge of the, the overall area here, um, he was kind of, he was giving these different names um, based on the Princess Bride, and uh, the one on the other there was another site that they that he called the Lightning Sands, uh, and because this, there was all this really loose uh, material, they could not get a good cross section, and so he called that the Lightning Sands. Um, my hole, he called that the pit of despair, because for the first day and a half I was despairing because I didn't think I was going to find anything. And so um, Kadash, um, the Turkish guy over here, and um, Tamar, uh, one of the Israeli students, um, they were over here in the building that was the combination kitchen, sleeping quarters, and they're finding all kinds of goodies over there. And I was, I was despairing because I was just kept making He's just like, keep at it, keep at it. We know they did something here because they arranged this, this semi-circle of big boulders here to shelter them from that north wind. And turns out what it was, was a ore processing site. And I got down to these ground stones, so it's kind of like the, the mortar and pestle idea. And it had these little, the little pockets where they were actually grinding the ore nodules like this and uh, I got to the point where I actually cleaned it out enough that I found ore embedded in that stone so it was pretty much 
Yeah. Four. Four, four conclusion that they were uh, using that as a <coughs> ore uh, processing site. So eventually, I was I was vindicated, and um, okay. again, and this was this was my cross section here, and it was very difficult to to keep keep going. Um, the uh, well, I'll, I think I've got more pictures of some of the other sites. Um, just kind of like the area, I guess you can see the ground stones here and here, and this is the unexcavated uh, section of the facility. What's the temperature? Um, we were there, uh, there was actually snow on the Edomite mountains uh, over in Jordan, and um, the first few days we were there, it was probably 40s, 40s to 50s, then it got into the 80s, and everybody started shedding clothes and getting sunburns uh, because you know, a lot of the people had come from the U.S. or Northern Europe or you know, places like that, and suddenly it was you know, it, well into the 80s, and I yeah, got a sunburn since it was February. But um, yeah, the summer, it is ridiculous. It's like 130 mm -hmm. during the days, so just, just not, not conducive to heavy labor. <laughs> Um, so this is one of the meter sticks, and so this um, also one of the um, the little uh, signboards that to identify uh, a kind of a completed square. So that tells tells a lot of the, the, the good information about dating, um, the site number, the date, and that that sort of thing. Um, that is the the habitation slash kitchen area. Um, I think that this, this might be adjacent to the, the tumulus. This is a, an area that we did a survey on, and it was unfortunate because they put these big power lines through that go down to a lot, and some of it we couldn't tell, you know, if, if they just pushed it up with a bulldozer or if this was, you know, an actual structure, and so it was, some of it was kind of a, a, a mystery, but there's still a lot of sites there. There's still a lot, a lot to explore. So this is one of the enclosures at the end of one of the desert kites. So um, this is an area that was uh, um, they, where they would actually herd the gazelles. And you can see that this is a, a, a wadi. So there'd be these long, long, just tiny little walls that they, they get the gazelles stampeding. The gazelles wouldn't want to jump the walls. And then they would run them off this little jump into these, into these pits. Uh, where they would kill them and then they would take them back to their village. There's a soft that is the, the guy that's uh, doing his thesis on the desert kites. Uh, this is the Samar um, gate palm plantation. This is on Highway 90, which is, runs the whole length of the country, parallel to the Dead Sea and the, the Jordan, all the way up to um, the Sea of Galilee and all the way down to the, the Red Sea. But um, yeah, just amazing that they can, can do this out there um, because they have the groundwater is there. Um, that's the Edomite Mountains in, in Jordan on the other side. So you can see they're very, very dramatic to suddenly just almost almost straight up mountains. And I, yeah, we did see a little bit of, of, of snow there um, a couple days after we, we arrived. Uh, this is actually going to the, the Muslim era site. So I mentioned that, that this was, by, by this time, you know, 700, 800 AD, they had gotten to the point where they were doing industrial scale uh, copper smelting. And so, yeah, instead of little tiny chunks of, of slag, you know, you, we were talking like dinner plate sized chunks of slag at this, at this location, just and piles and piles of it. Um, but it was interesting that they had actually set themselves up a mosque here, and they figured from the date and everything, it's very interesting because this mosque has two alcoves um, this one is facing towards Mecca, and the one on the other side is facing towards Jerusalem. And so they're able to, to date that um, to a, a point where the, um, the religious um, you know, devotion towards Jerusalem was at least as equal to Mecca. And um, this actually might be the oldest mosque in the world. Mm. So not very complete, but it's a, a very neat outline. And you would never guess this place is there. You, you, you hike in this... You know, the last picture is this, you know, that, yeah, this little tiny path. It's like a goat path that goes into this kind of crater-like depression. But that was where, where this, this was located. 
So yeah, there's a beautiful piece of, of slag. Uh, this would happen when they would uh, tap the furnaces. So the furnaces were like a, a terracotta type of clay, and they would have the, the um, coals and everything in the bottom, and then they would um, actually break the, the pot, really, and the slag would come off of the, the top, and then you'd have a nice layer of copper underneath, and then you'd have your, your cinders and that sort of thing in the bottom. So, but this is just, just beautiful because you can see how it just flowed like, like lava or something out of the, out of the furnace when they, they broke the furnace. I guess that's that it. I, that can't be the last one. <laughs> no, I don't want to change. <clears throat> Yes, the last one. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, there's, there's, there's more. There's more. Okay. So, um, so the place we stayed at the Tindo Park, um, they had a, a visitor center. And like I said, it's a little bit touristy. You had the the swan boats and that sort of thing. And uh, one of the the um, main deals that they did um, for the tourists was they had these little bottles and you. They had sand that they collected in different parts of the park that were different colors. So they'd have yellow and they'd have kind of an aqua color and they'd have black. And you would um, fill, it up, fill up the bottles and put a little cork in it. And um, they had a, a, an area that was kind of a, um, it was kind of our meeting area. It was where our classes were. But they, every day they would put out this, this spread of falafel and all the fixings, as I would say. So <laughs> you had your couscous and your pita and it's like, Oh, this is great. And after about eight or nine days of eating nothing, we <laughs> called it death by falafel. So we were very, very tired of falafel. Um, so uh, a group of us that said we were going to have like a falafel mutiny or an anti-falafel mutiny if we didn't get some, some beers and burgers. So we went down to, um, to a lot and, and found a, a hamburger joint, so uh, we were very, very happy, some, 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 some very happy people here tonight. I think that's the, the sunrise, so that's the, the mountains to the west, um, like I said, where the, the copper uh, was below these mountains, and then just, just beyond the tops of those mountains is the Egyptian border, and so it was very interesting because we were about three miles from Egypt on the west, and about three miles from Jordan on the east, mm -hmm. and it was like my phone. I'd walk out in the morning and it'd say, "Welcome to Egypt," and I turn around and walk over here and say, "Welcome to Jordan." <laughs> but it was it was the it was a very narrow part of the country because it's just this little little tiny spit of land that runs down to the the Red Sea. So they have that port at a lot. So this is the uh, the road that I was talking about that they bulldozed in which made it a lot easier for us. Um, we, we park at the Kibbutz of Samar um, in the mornings and walk oh, about a mile out there. And it was definitely easier to walk on this bulldozed road than it was out through all the, the, the rubble. And um, we were actually walking on this one day and um, the, the gal that was our uh, assistant area supervisor, uh, one, one, of these, one of the other students found a, a beautiful flint knife on the road and said, Oh, we'll, we'll definitely give this to Tamar for her, her personal collection. Mm -hmm. And I think that they waited till the end and, and gave it to her. Yeah. <coughs> and there's a, that's the, again, the, the place where they use the, the wind to fire the furnace. And that's it. Who has questions? Here comes the light. Oh. Oh. Thanks for the warning. <laughs> I wanted to ask you about the artifacts. Oh, yes, there. yes. How, so, how were you allowed to bring them out of the country? Well, for one thing, the, um, the fact that we were on an official uh, expedition that was allowed to take things um, from the, the site, you could take anything you wanted. No, you could not. <laughs> no. Well, these, and like I said, but these, these things were out of context. And, um, but there's a lot of, there's places there. And where we were, was, it was not such a, a big deal because um, there, there's not a lot of material 
left. It's just you, you have to kind of kind of guess, and um, that was one of the the, the big things that um, I was I was kind of mentioning that Eris Ben Yosef has has kind of you know, opened up this Pandora's box because um, there's this whole bias uh, against nomads, and it's, it's because people are used to going in and saying, oh, there's these monumental structures, there was a society here. We hardly know anything about the Edomites, but we know that they were a very powerful trading kingdom, they were a mining kingdom, um, they were very much uh, a, a trading partner, but also rivals of the, the Jewish state uh, at that time. Um, so, but we have very little of their, their material because they were nomadic. And uh, there's kind of this bias that says that nomadic people can't be civilized. Uh, nomadic can't, people can't have empires, but you look at the Mongols, and I mean, the Mongols were nomadic and they, you know, conquered half the world practically. So, um, that, that, was, that was a, you know, that was one of the, the, the big things about that. But um, there's, there's places too where um, there's so much, so much pottery, they, they cart it away by the, mostly in those tells where there's just um, piles of it. But the ones that are really important are the ones they call the uh, diagnostic pieces of pottery. So it's something that has like a, uh, a handle or a rim or something so the style they can tell what it was. But a lot of the other pieces of pottery that are just fragments and they can't, they're not uh, diagnostic. They're just, they just literally cart them off and dump them in a ravine. So. Wow. <laughs> but yes, and then this was something that Tony wanted me to show you. So this is um, the the copper and the king, so this is about the, the dig, and it's kind of uh, references to the uh, United Monarchy, and this was actually chosen as Smithsonian's top story for last year, so oh, oh, very, God. very, very interesting there. Um, but yeah, if you guys want to come up and look at these, so these are, again, they're from the, the area that was destroyed, so we didn't know exactly from, from when they were, because the, the bulldozer bulldozed everything together. But we know that the flint plates were probably from uh, cutting tools for household knives and that sort of thing. Um, this is really neat because this is one of the fragments of one of the furnaces. So it is almost like a, a terracotta. It's even that, that kind of color. Uh, you can see the inside is kind of carbonized because that was the part that was exposed to all the heat. Um, the copper ore nodules, like I was saying too, these are like little concentrated copper pills. Um, a very small piece of slag that actually still, you know, this was one of the very earliest ones where they weren't getting very good efficiency because you can see on the slag you can also see copper ore so they weren't getting, you know, really good smelting from it. And then these are just fun. Um, there were lots and lots of fossils, fossilized uh, oh. shellfish around where we were and every now and then we'd find a little stash of them and so what we, we figured, uh, because it was very likely that these were families that were doing this, and it's like, you kids get, get out of here, go, go find something to do. Why don't you go collect, see how many fossils you can collect and put in a pile. And so um, that, was, that was pretty fun too. Um, but, um, let's see what else. Is this finance or do you pay your own way? I, I pay my own way. Um, if you're a volunteer, you just volunteer. The, it was pretty, the, the housing and food was pretty subsidized. I mean, it was, it was, I think, twelve hundred dollars for the whole thing. So uh, for wow. housing, housing and food for How long two weeks, about two weeks. So yeah. um, not bad. So um, let's see, other questions. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, if you want to look at this too, this is a, this is the, the pamphlet from the the Timna Park that kind of shows a map of all of the the attractions and everything that's there. And uh, what organization did you go through? I mean, how did you find out? So first of all, it was the Biblical Archaeology Review Magazine. Every year they have a digs edition, okay. um, and that will tell you who, who, the, who the director is, who the sponsoring school is, that sort of thing, and then the contact for that school. And then I got a hold of uh, Tel Aviv University and um, found out you know, how much it was going to be and when and that sort of thing. There you go. So I expect to see you all there next year. It's yeah. happening in December this year. Yeah. It's really, it's really, really fun. Just great people. Happy go